to another video. If you're new to the channel, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below and go check out our Instagram pages where I post daily original photos of our life, our animals, and everything in between. So for today's video, we are going to be doing a setup video for a brand new reptile we are getting. So this is a surprise for my kids. It is an adoption. Um, it came up and I'll explain a little bit further in a second, but I am not going to be saying the name of this particular species of reptile because it is a surprise and they do not know what it is yet. So as you can see from the title of this video, you already know what it is. So for this particular reptile species, there are a bunch of subspecies. So in this video, this setup is going to be specifically for a northern, which are indigenous to northern Australia. So the other main one is going to be your Indonesian and the setups can be very, very similar. Um, their cages are going to be slightly different. So because this is an adoption slash rest, I don't know if you want to call it a rescue. Um, there was somebody local to us who we have met before and we're part of a reptile group. And uh, this particular person had some extenuating circumstances that came up that are going to limit their ability to properly take care of this animal. So they made the difficult decision to go ahead and try to uh, place this animal in a different home. Now, they didn't just post it on Craigslist or on Morph Market or anything like that. They actually went into our reptile group and they chose a few people that they know or they knew would properly care for the animal. And I was one of them. And this person reached out to me and asked if I would be interested. And I obliged, of course. So um, this is not a particular species that I have ever been interested in. Um, but my oldest child is very, very interested in the species and has always wanted one. So, buddy, this is for you. So in the time frame we had, um, we were kind of limited in our time frame as far as uh, supplies and things to get. So um, eventually I would like to build uh, this particular reptile, probably a six by two by two wood enclosure. But for now, uh, the only thing I was able to find is an aquarium. Now I am not too fond of aquarium setups, especially for these kind of species because they don't hold in humidity. And I'm just not too fond of them because of where we live in our climate. Um, while it is summertime and it is a little bit warmer, in the wintertime we do get snow and we do get colder temperatures and the glass aquariums do not hold in the heat uh, like I need because I don't wanna be running my heater 24 seven in the house the electric bill would be sky high. So during the winter, we usually keep our house around 65, 70. And for my reptiles, that's just usually not adequate with a glass aquarium, which is why we have winterized a lot of our glass enclosures with some kind of insulating foam board. Now, obviously this guy, this guy or gal will be getting a wood enclosure before our next winter. However, this is what I could get in the time frame. So it is recommended that a minimum for this particular species, doesn't matter if you have an Indonesian or a Northern, is going to be a four by two by two. However, um, that is a bit small. So most um, reptile enthusiasts would recommend no less than a 75 gallon, which is what I was able to pick up locally. Now, I would have liked to go a little bit larger, maybe 100 or 120 gallon, but that just wasn't available in the time frame that I had. So because I got a Northern, their humidity requirements are a lot lower than an Indonesian. Um, an aquarium, a setup like I'm going to show you, is not adequate for an Indonesian. Now the setup itself would be okay. However, you would need to do a wood or PVC enclosure because the Indonesians require about a 70% humidity level. Um, with a screen top, that is just not possible to obtain. So everything in this video would be useful if you have an Indonesian, except for the cage itself. Like I said, I would recommend a PVC enclosure or a solid wood enclosure that will keep in that heat to create that necessary high humidity. Other than that, everything else is going to be practically the same. So for a northern, humidity needs to be about 40 to 60% which is relatively the same as like a bearded dragon or any other Australian species. And of course, in my videos, there always has to be that one annoying fly. 
So sorry if I keep going like this, but there's one annoying fly that just keeps wanting to land on my head. Just like most reptiles, this reptile also needs a thermal gradient, which means that they need a cool side and a warm side. Now the cool side can be around 80 degrees at night. I would never go less than 75 degrees as far as cool. Now on the warm side, during the day, you want to have some kind of hot spot, basking spot of about 100 degrees. The Northerns need a little bit higher basking spot. The Indonesians, you can have a little bit lower. They don't really need as much of a basking spot. So the last thing I'm gonna touch on before we actually dive into setting up this enclosure is going to be a UVB light bulb or fixture. Um, this particular species, it is controversial whether they need UVB or not. Now it is said because they are a burrowing species that they do not require it. It has been documented that this particular species has lived a long and healthy life without it. However, there are many people that argue that they thrive and do a lot better with it. So just like any other lizard in our collection or in our house, we do provide UVB. Um, the other lizards I have are monitor species and they do require it or they can get metabolic bone disease. However, um, this particular species has not been known to get those things without UVB, but we are going to be providing it nonetheless. And that is personal preference. Like I said, some people swear by it that you need it, but others have shown that they can thrive without it. So I'm going to leave that up to personal preference, whether you want to provide that for your species or not. So now we're going to go ahead and set up the enclosure. All right, so first things first, we have a brand new tank. So we're gonna wanna disinfect the tank really good, make it nice and clean. And right now I'm using some of our F10 disinfectant and I'm just gonna wipe it out completely just to make sure there's no leftover residue from the manufacturer or wherever it has been kept. So now I am adding some construction paper to the side of the tank because I'm going to block out three sides of this aquarium to limit the visibility of the animal to help decrease stress as we acclimate this new animal to our environment. A lot of lizard species will get stressed out if they can see too much or if there's too much movement in the room. So now that we have all three sides blocked out, and the aquarium is completely clean, it is time to add substrate. For our substrate, I am using Reptichip. It is a substrate that I use for a lot of my animals because it is very versatile. I like that I can keep it dry or I can wet it down and it holds humidity very, very well. Since this is a burrowing species, I have chosen to do a depth of substrate that is four to six inches. And now that we have the depth that we need, it is time to add some decor. For the decor, I'm gonna be using some large pieces of natural cork bark that have a little bit of round in them to kind of create an artificial burrow for this burrowing species. Once I have it in place where I want it, I go ahead and add some reptichip around the edges to smooth out the top to create a little bit of an uneven surface and a surface where the skink won't be able to turn over. So now I'm gonna go ahead and repeat the same step on the other side. And we are done with the decor for the time being. And now you can see that the substrate is already creating necessary humidity under the surface. There is a nice hide for the skink to burrow down. And here is another one where the skink can go into the semi half log that continues underneath the hot spot to gain a warmer area. And there is also another spot to exit. This aquarium did not come with a screen top, so I was able to find this nice Zilla screen top on Amazon, and I can leave it the link to this screen down in the description below. All right, so now we are on to the heating and lighting. 
So let's go ahead and look at the supplies that I purchased first, and then we will go ahead and get them installed. So I purchased two of these Fluker dome lights. They're the eight and a half inch clamp lamps, which I'm not gonna be using the clamp. We're just gonna be setting it right on top of the screen. It has 150 watt maximum, and it has the dimmer. Now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm gonna be putting uh, the bulbs in there. And these are the two bulbs I got. I got 150 watt and 100 watt. Always check the maximum wattage of your dome fixtures. You never want to go over the maximum wattage. You risk, you run the risk of a fire. These are only rated to that and they can get very, very hot and you do not want anything catching on fire. That is no bueno. So I ended up getting these with the dimmer so I do not have to run a thermostat. When you run a dimmer, you have to make sure that you have one of these. And that is going to be some kind of way to tell the temperature. The best way is going to be some kind of heat gun. Um, you can get these off of Amazon for about 15, 20 bucks. They're fairly cheap and they're very, very accurate. These are a lot more accurate than those little thermometers that you stick on the cage. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm gonna be getting our heat bulbs set up into our lamps and on. And then I'm going to be checking the temperature with this to make sure that the temperatures are accurate. If they're too hot, then it has this nifty little dimmer switch. I can tone it down and lower the temperature until I get it to where I want it. Now, if you're in an area where the temperatures fluctuate quite frequently, then you might want to run a thermostat. My sunroom stays a fairly, you know, normal temperature. And because this is open on the top and heat can rise, I'm not too worried about it getting too hot at this point. So I'm going to run the dimmer. Now, if for some reason something changes, um, maybe when we build another cage, I will run a thermostat. But for now, this is what we are going to do. So I got two lamps and that is because we are going to be running them off timers. I got a uh, one outlet and this is just going to be for one lamp. And then this one is a two outlet and that'll be running the daytime lamp with the UVB. So we're going to go ahead and set up the UVB with our daytime hotspot heat lamp over here. And that is going to be our 150 watt bulb. And then we're going to be running another lamp on the cool side with the 100 watt because at night, like I said, in my house, the temperature drops below 75 degrees. So we wanna make sure that we can maintain that above 75 for this particular reptile or we run the risk of respiratory infections and we don't want that. So now we're gonna go ahead and get these set up. Okay, now that there's that one fly again. Now that we got everything dialed in or plugged in, I should say, I left all the cords up here so I could show you what I did. And I just realized that I purchased this figure, this fixture and totally forgot to buy the bulb. So later on in this video, I will show you what bulb I am gonna be putting in this. But for right now, there's no bulb in that, but it will be turned on later in the video. So we have our, this is gonna be our warm side and this is gonna be our cool side, two of the same fixtures. This one has our 150 watt bulb and the cool side is going to have our 100 watt bulb. Now I have them both turning or turned on right now because I wanna make sure that they both warm up before I fix these timers. So, um, as you can see, I kind of have this pet peeve with organization. And if you are the same way, you can pick up these little gear ties from Home Depot or Lowe's. They come a bunch in a pack and they have multiple colors. So I like to use those. This way I can see that this is for the warm side. This is for the cool side. And then I have everything buckled up because my biggest pet peeve is cords everywhere. So I'm letting them both, both warm up, as I said, so I can make sure that they both work. These are fairly easy to set. You just push down or pull up for whichever time that you want it, the fixture to be on. And I will show you that in just a second. So what I'm going to do is 
the warm side will be on 12 hours a day. However, there is going to be a 15 minute overlap. And that is because we want this bulb to be fully warmed up when this one turns off. We don't want this one to turn off and then this one's warming up because then the cage is gonna drastically cool. Or the other way around, this one will turn off and then there's gonna be this 15 minute period when the warm side is trying to warm up in the morning. So we don't want that. So there's gonna be a 15 minute overlap between each cycle. So when in the evening time, when this one is about 15 minutes from shutting off, this one will turn on and warm up and vice versa. So let me go ahead and set these and then I will show you how exactly you do that. Okay, I needed to double check just to make sure I do this right. So on the top here, you're gonna have outlet on or timer on. If you want, if you're gonna use this timer dial, you wanna make sure that it's all the way this way, which I have that on right now. So all of the little indicators are pushed down right now. Let's give you a little, little closer view here. So when they are pushed down, this means that they are on. And then whatever one you want, you just bring them up and that is going to be off. So, but first you have to set what time it is. So let's go ahead and set what time it is. So in order to set the time, let's see if I can do this one-handed while holding the camera. So all you do is turn it like so. It's hard to do, oh, there we go. Now we can do it one-handed. So it is 10 after six right now. So we're just gonna put it right there on six. Now, I am not gonna pull these up just yet because like I said, I want the heat lamps to warm up. But so all you would do is the times you want off. So I'm gonna do a 12 hour cycle on and off. If it was six right now, then by 6.30, I would want this off. So all you do, so I'm gonna do it a little bit because I don't want these off yet. But all you do is you pull all these up for when you want them off. And all it does is it pulls the dial up. So as the dial moves around, there's no power connecting over here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna wait a little bit and get these set. So just a quick side note, when you are warming up brand new heat emitters, bulbs, fixtures like this, when they are brand, brand new, you want to keep an eye on them for a good 30 minutes to an hour at minimum to make sure that everything is in working order. Uh, this does produce very high heat. And if you're not paying attention and the fixture has a malfunction um, or it's not working properly, it could cause a fire. Now, I also want to note that because these are ceramic and so is the ceramic bulb inside, that these do smell when you first turn them on. Now it is not harmful to your animal, although I wouldn't have an animal in here until your, your heat and everything was dialed in to begin with. But just to note, these do give off a slight burning smell when they are brand new. And it does dissipate after an hour or two. So that is another reason I'm warming them up is to kind of get that smell gone because I have a very strong sniffer and when things smell off, especially when I smell burning down in my sunroom where all of my reptiles are that have to have heat, that is a big concern for me and I start checking everything. So um, this is just for me to kind of get that smell out of the way and I'm really paying attention to what's going on here. Now, one other thing is you might have noticed that I put these little clamps on here um, when we're not actually clamping it to anything. And this is kind of like my little hack. I like to put these on there. And then as you can see, I kind of clamped the cord and that is so the cord doesn't lay on the edge of the fixture. Because when these fixtures are running the 100 and 150 watt, this gets very, very hot. And you don't want to run the risk of it melting your cord. So, and this gets very hot as well. So if you can see, it comes out at the top and it's not touching. And I do that for my peace of mind. So it's not, nothing is sitting against this hot dome fixture. It comes down here and then it sits on the rest of the grate. So that is not something you have to do, but it's just kind of a little hack and gives me a little bit of a peace of mind. Now, if you're going to be doing your UVB sitting on top, 
I highly, highly recommend the Zoomed Reptison. And this is the T8 Terrarium a Hood. And these are the two bulbs it takes. Now, um, I didn't go get the bulbs, so I'm going to be going to get one of these tomorrow. Um, I am I will probably do the 5.0, but we will see because there is such a distance between the top to the bottom here, I might end up running the 10.0. And that is just so it has enough range to go to the bottom. Because if your animal is too far from the UVB, then it won't get any at all. And so we want to make sure that it's going to get something else. The UVB light is kind of useless. So I highly, highly recommend these. If you end up doing a PVC or a wood enclosure, then I would highly recommend an Arcadia fixture that you can mount inside. Um, you can use the same bulb or you can use Arcadia bulbs as well. And I can link all of this stuff down in the description below. But just to take a look at what an Arcadia fixture looks like. Hi, dude. i sorry I woke you up and I startled you. But an Arcadia fixture looks something like that. It has the little clips on top that you can mount to the top. You have the cord that goes out the side and it can sit in there like that. And then the bulb just runs up there. And these are great if you need something like this where you're using PVC and you want it inside. Hello, what you doing, huh? Hi. I sorry, I ruined your nap, my bad. So overall, not a bad setup, just not something that I would usually prefer for my region. Like I said, just because the glass tends to let a lot of the heat escape. Now, if I notice that temperatures are still staying pretty low, I have the option to run some of the insulating foam board. I have some in the garage around the sides. Some, you know, like I've done some of my other cages that look like this. This is how I've done our emerald tree boa. And it's just our tech insulating foam board that you can get at your local hardware store. I believe this one is a half an inch thick and I just line the sides and it helps keep a lot of the heat in. So another thing I can also do if I find that the heat is escaping or the humidity is too low is I can actually buy some pre-cut plexiglass um, from your local hardware store and you can actually set it on top to help keep that heat and humidity down in the cage. All right, so, so now that these have been on for a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and show you kind of where we're at. Looks like we're at the 90 degree range and we still have a little bit more to go as far as heating. Okay, I don't know where that's reading. But on top of this log, which would be more of its basking spot, we're looking at 91-ish, which I would like to see it a little bit hotter. So we'll see how much warmer this gets. Now, if it doesn't get up to closer to 100, Another thing I'm thinking about doing is adding a basking rock over here because the heat, the rock will absorb the heat and give it a nice spot to go and lay on for that extra high heat. So that is another option. So, and then on this side, I just kind of did it. We're looking at about 83, which is really, really good for the cool side. All right, so we are going to let our cage simmer overnight with those heat bulbs and we are going to check back on everything in the morning and we are going to be going to pick up our animal tomorrow as well. All right, one last thing I want to note is all of your extra boxes, not necessarily your trash, but all of these boxes you want to make sure you keep for at least 30 to 60 days. Now, I would also check on the back and check the warranty on these. These have a one-year warranty on this Zoomed Reptisun. As long as you have the box, you have to keep the box. So if your fixture goes out in one year or less, you need to make sure you keep your receipt and the box and they will replace it for free. Now, most places like PetSmart or Petco where you can get a lot of these products, if the product stops working within 30 days, 
Some are longer, some you can get away with 60 days. As long as you have your receipt, you can take it back and you can get a full refund or exchange. So that is why you always want to keep the boxes. And that goes for your bulbs as well. Now, I order my bulbs from Amazon. Now, Amazon has its own policy. It's typically 30 days, but sometimes around certain events or the holidays, it ex it's extended to 90 days. So if you buy your bulbs sometime in November, December, and they go out in January, you can a lot of times return these for a brand new bulb if it goes out within that 90 days. So just keep in mind, keep your boxes for a little length of time. Make sure they work properly. A lot of times you can, you'll throw away the boxes and then you'll realize that you should have kept them. All right. All right. So it is the next morning and we have gone to pick up our little critter. And now the kids know exactly what it is. It is a Northern blue tongue skinks. We are super excited to take this little guy or gal home and put him in his new aquarium. Are you guys ready? Yes. And then we'll show you what he looks like. Her, him. I'm just going to call it a him for now. I don't really know. Yeah. All right. Is that a shoe, Lubby? Nice shoe. Yeah. All right. So let's take this critter home. All right, guys. So we made it home and I went and got a new bulb. I decided to go with the 5.0 just because uh, this little guy doesn't need a whole lot of the UVB. So I didn't go with the 10.0. We just want to give him a little bit, just to give him that little added UVB that he may or may not need. So we're going to go ahead and get this in and get it turned on. And we let the temperature simmer overnight. Everything is perfect. Got all the dials set and everything. So I'm gonna get this in and we're gonna get a water dish in and then we're gonna show you our little guy or gal. Okay, so we got its water dish in here. The person that we got this animal from said that they really enjoy, <laughs> that this animal really enjoys this Pyrex baking dish. Um, there's probably about maybe a half an inch worth of water you don't want to do too much water because obviously they can't swim. They will drown, but they do enjoy soaking. So we're going to use this for now, see how it works. We may or may not change it. Um, the only thing that I have not acquired yet is the foliage for this. Um, we did get a lot of fake leaves and branches and things to kind of cover the bottom to kind of let it uh, move through, hide under, burrow under, um, just for some extra enrichment. And we have not gotten that yet. So That'll be coming here in the next few days. Now, let's go ahead and show you the animal that's going in here. Okay. All right. So, now let's see. I, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. I think I've said this. What's up? Hi. Let's check it out, guys. Look at it. Isn't it beautiful? You want to see its colors? Move slow because it's a little frightened. It's a new environment. It's just a giant potato with little legs. And there's that iconic blue tongue of the blue tongue skink. Now, I don't know if you can see. Zoom in on its tail, Parker. It does have a kink in its tail. Now, these guys aren't really known for getting metabolic bone disease. So, um, she actually got this from somebody else who told her that it was an injury. So we don't exactly know how it happened, but it doesn't seem to affect the animal. It's just there, it's kind of a minor defect. Oh, I know, okay, sorry. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and put this little guy in here. Go ahead. Let's see, can we get you? There we go. And there he is, or she in the new home. We're gonna leave him be for about a week or two to explore. And then we're gonna show you when we feed it its first meal. That's gonna be absolutely awesome. So as I said in the beginning of this video, this is a Northern Blue Tongue Skinks. These guys originate from Australia. So even though we don't know for sure if this animal is captive born and bred, um, more than likely, it is a captive bred animal only because you cannot, um, Australia does not export any of their natural wildlife uh, outside the country anymore. So more than likely, uh, this little thing is a captive born animal. It is also approximately two to three years old. So this is an adult.
which we were happy to get because then we don't have to go through all the baby stages. So overall, these reptiles are very easy to keep. They are pretty mellow. You only have to feed them one to two times a week. They don't eat very much. So as far as handling, you just kind of support their body. Now, kind of a cool thing about blue tongue skinks um, that I was not aware of till recently is you have to make sure you support them very well when you're handling them um, because they have been known to let their tail go and that is very, very disgusting. So it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. So we're gonna have to be very careful when we're handling this little dude or girl it um so they don't they tolerate handling well but it's not something that they're terribly fond of so probably once or twice a week um after after this thing gets acclimated is when we will handle Looks like it found a nice safe spot to go chillax. Let it de-stress a bit. So we got an, a cool new animal and I'm glad we were able to help this person out and rehoming so they know it went to a good home. We're gonna take fabulous care of this little thing. And I will show future videos of us handling and feeding and all that good stuff. So if you're really into blue tongue skinks, be sure to subscribe to the channel for future videos. All right, everyone. Well, that is it for today's Northern Blue Tongue Skinks set up video. We are super happy to have this little thing. We are glad we could help this person out with finding it a really good home. My kids are super excited for this little thing. <laughs> this is not a species that I was ever interested in keeping. They are so funny looking, but definitely interesting. So we are glad to have this in our collection. Oh, it's good. It's an experience. Never thought I would ever own one of these. So for sure, great to have it. So again, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Like the video if you liked it. Shoot a comment down below if you have any suggestions on my setup or any advice for a brand new blue tongue skink owner. And again, thank you for watching. Stay safe. Stay sane. Get out there and make your own footprints. Bye.